fortnight ago, we wilted in the heat of Mizano. Not the case here at Zandvoort for the third round of the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe Series. And the car's going out onto a circuit. It's just been dampened by rain, but it's very cool. Track conditions, it's around 20, around 16 degrees track temperature. I'm Bruce Jones, sitting in the security of the commentary box with John Watson, but it's far, far trickier for the drivers out on the circuit, John. Indeed it is, Bruce. It's uh, on traditional weather at this time of year in Zandvoort. Normally you'd expect it to be sunny, maybe a bit of wind. Uh, you'd even have the concern about the, the sand dunes, which, of course, the circuit is in the centre of those sand dunes. Will it be windswept and sand been blown on the racetrack? Well, what you can see in the camera lens there, as the cars make their way around, this is down into turn nine, around the back of the circuit. 2.6 miles in length, 4.3 kilometres and the GT3 field is bit by bit drip feeding and that's not a fun. Sorry for that at this early hour in the morning. And making their way out onto the field is the 51, I'm sorry, the 519. Well, that's the FFF Go ahead. I was going to say with Hiroshi Hamaguchi and Phil Keith leading the championship in the Pro-Am class, yes. so really good. I mean, not only right at the sharp end with Corderelli and Mapelli, who we saw take the first win for the team at Mizano two weeks ago, but uh, right now, leading the prime class. So the Chinese racing team, you can see the Chinese flag just behind the, uh, the window on the side of the car. Uh, really, really making a splash. Effectively, in previous seasons, it's been the Grasser racing team that's been doing all the winning for Lamborghini. New kids on the block and really, really making an impression. But the number four Black Falcon Mercedes, a, a car that just doesn't seem to put a foot wrong, leading the championship moment by six points over Cordarelli and Mapelli. So the Black Falcon pairing of Mauro Engel and Lucas Stoltz, good in all conditions. And, and this car was the quickest car in what was free practice two Friday afternoon when conditions actually were heavier. The rain was much, much heavier. The track then gradually sort of began to get a drying line, but it was the number four, a Black Falcon Mercedes, Mauro Engel behind the wheel that was quickest in that session. It's really academic, but the, the best lap that we got from that second session on Friday afternoon was 145.2. It's a benchmark to give us some indication as to where we might expect. The track conditions are more of the slick nature than the pure wet nature, which is actually often more challenging for a driver because wet weather tires like water to grip and uh, to us how they're designed to work. These changeable conditions mean that the car will be sliding a lot more and therefore the wet weather tires not able to do the job it's designed to do, but it's not yet anywhere near dry enough to think of putting a set of slick tires on because there is no sign of a drying line anywhere around this racetrack. And just to give you a clue what a good dry time was uh, in the first of the sessions, it was a 1 minute 36.9 second lap, so uh, that's something, well, they could aim at it, but they're not going to achieve it with the track as it is at the moment. But just to point out, Lucas Stoltz at the wheel, sharing with Mauro Engel, the black Falcon Mercedes, Opening round, the second and the first at Brands Hatch, second round at Lizano, a third and a fourth, not just at the front, but consistently so. Such a strong pairing. Let's see what they can do here. Well, there's a 146.8, so it's what, just over half a second away from the time that this car, with Mauro Engel behind the wheel, achieved. So, track condition, first lap, that's a pretty good effort. Certainly, you can see that Lucas Dolz is pushing the car pretty much to the limits of the, the grip that are available. And it is a racetrack, as I mentioned, built amongst the sand dunes here in Zandvoort. 20 turns on this 2.6 mile racetrack. But this section here, this is part of the original search. There's been many variations of Zandvoort, but this is for me, this sums up what racing the sand dunes is all about. This turn around the back of the circuit, it's called Schweilach, I think it's Schweilach or something. Schweilach. Schweilach. It is turn 10, and that is the corner. If you're going to get caught out, that's where you're going to get caught out. And also, when you have single-seater racing, it's a bit one-by-one one round there, but in GT racing, I've seen two, three abreast in Scheiblack. You don't always get two or three out of the far end of the corner. It's such a tricky place, but it keeps dropping away from you, and your entry visibility is... We've just it's, got to imagine. It's, it's, a, it's a corner of all the racetracks and all the countries and all the world that I've ever raced on. Zandvoort was one of those racetracks which I felt made you feel you were a racing driver. It's got that... I had that combination. The, the change in the circuit, which occurred back, I think, 1999, when it was short, principally, to allow for the development of residential homes. And, of course, the circuit looking forward to 2020, when it will be upgraded to F1... Well, F1 Grade 1 standard. 
Now, when, what that will involve with the racetrack, I don't know, but certainly all the other areas around the facilities will have to be uh, addressed as well. Yeah, it'll be a massive boost, but the one thing it will be sure of uh, is whatever they do to the circuit, there'll be 200,000 people, I reckon, in orange shirts screaming for Max Verstappen. We can always see the DutchGP.com logos around the circuit, a nation passionate about its racing, and Zambor looks fabulous at any time of year, but when the spectator banks, the dunes, are packed with people, it really is a marvellous place. Who is it, setting the times early on, Dodge? I just want to say, Lucas Dogs, Tom, we saw him in the Black Falcon, Mercedes Mirko Bortolotti starting to pick up the pace in the 63 Lamborghini coming through, but it's very early days. They're just trying to gauge where the grip is. Bortolotti looking to see where that God, quick is now. goes top. Just looking from on the charts, there he was. OK, quickest by seven, by three quarters of a second. But we've got a 20 minute qualifying session. It's quick fire, but all the drivers know the track is going to be drying out as they go around. So yeah, I mean, literally awesome. by the lap, you will find a difference in the grip level at every corner compared to the previous laps of Mirko Bortolotti, currently quickest the ball, fastest overall in the first sector, fastest overall in the third sector on that quickest of his lap. And you can see Bortolotti's the car looks confident, and I say the car looks confident, the body language of the car, it's, it's working in harmony in tricky conditions. Mirko Bortolotti, a load of confidence coming through turn 10, really able to run wide, then swoop down into the compression, and then the car rushes out up to turn 10. So what we have at the moment is Borsalotti ahead of Calderelli, one Lamborghini ahead of another. Bastian and Stoltz set third and fourth in their Mercedes, and then two Aston Martins, they went two by two. Aro Venia looking at him now, the Finn is fifth fastest. Ricky Collard is sixth, but uh, big spread of times, almost half a second for Borsalotti at the top of the charts ahead of Calderelli. Let's see if can Venia improve this time around. He's fifth at the moment, coming up to complete another lap, and... Uh, but he does improve his time, but he stays in fifth position, just under a second down on the ultimate pace. Track is drying, drivers gaining in confidence. Of course, everybody is on wet weather tyres. This is not anywhere near a circuit that would handle a slick tyre, and if you ventured out in the slick tyre, you'd probably want to come straight back into the pits. And you can see just coming round the hairpin bend, that infamous Hugenholz box. Remember the circuit, the visionary that John Hugenholz was back in the very early days following World War II when this circuit was conceived and then actually created so far ahead of its time in every aspect. I suppose one might say people thought what John Hugenholz did in here at Zandvoort was almost heretic because everybody had raced primarily in Europe on pure road circuits. Permanent racetracks were something that no one had ever really considered. Yes, I mean, if you went beyond the likes of Brooklyn's with the bank corners, but in terms of that, of course, he went off and left a huge foot, footprint in the world racing scene with Suzuka as well. He, he designed some epic, epic circuits. Bortolotti still top. But uh, look at that. We can't show you blue sky, but wonderful view out of the back, the onboard facing rearwards from the Aston Martin, so I'm sure that'll come into use in the race, and it's being driven very well indeed by the Finn Aerovenio. Fifth fastest, no improvements coming this time. Just want to pick down the timesheets, John. We actually have a, a car new to this championship this weekend, the Volpan GT World Challenge Europe, in the, driven by Olivier Panis's boy, Aurelien, in the Lexus from Panis Partez Racing. He's 24th out of 28 at the moment. Uh, welcome to the championship. Uh, but he's been racing in touring cars in TCR, GT4, and now he's stepping up to GT3. He's learning the circuit, he's learning the car, but uh, not expecting great fireworks, but uh, doing a good, solid job at the moment. Well, we know that the Lexus, certainly last year, was a very quick car, very competitive car, ended up winning the six hours of Paul Ricard, but now it's a private entry. Nevertheless, it's a car that has got certainly good pace, but with the, in relatively inexperienced as Ezekiel Perro's compact, making a comeback after that very, very severe accident is involved in, in the opening laps of the Paul Ricard six hours, where he got a fracture to a vertebrae. So he flew back home, believe it or not, all the way back to Buenos Aires in Argentina, which I can't imagine was a very good idea. But anyway, he wants to get back behind the wheel because his focus is not really so much on this particular event. He wants to be race fit for the, the great event, the big event, the 24 hours of spa Francorchamps in a fortnight's time. And talking about that, Bruce, everybody is fully conscious that they need not to put a foot wrong here this weekend because any damage, potential damage to a car could have a bearing on preparation and what would happen in terms of an entry. So please, I don't have to say it, remember 
two weeks' time. In fact, in one week's time, you've got to be on your way. You've got to be rolling into Spa-Francorchamps with your trucks and all your infrastructure and getting set up because it is an, a week-long event now. Absolutely so. It is the big one. But you just hope there's not one team manager at the end who will be saying to his driver, what was the one thing I told you not to do in this race? But plenty of space to race. Ezekiel Perez compact. Look at him going around in the number one Audi. Doesn't look as though he's going to improve this time. He's seventh fastest at the moment. So, in fact, the top second covers down to fifth place, which is Aravenio, but it's still the Lamborghinis, Mirko Bortolotti ahead of Andrea Calderelli, Christopher Mies, Dries Van Tour, waiting their turn in session number two. What they don't know about racing Audis, nobody knows. Well, Christopher Mies this weekend is pairing, along with the winner from two weekends ago, Charles Fert, and, of course, Dries Van Tour was the partner of Charles Fert when they took that big trip. Yep, the young gun who became the slightly older gun it must be quite a bit cute because obviously for Dries Van Tour, he was the young gun in the Team WRT pit. But he's racing again with Ezekiel Perez Compec and then watching his car, seventh fastest at the moment. Vast majority of the cars are back in the pit lane. The sky is getting brighter, John, here at Zandvoort. So wet coming off. I don't know why they would be taking them off because currently the track is not in a condition to consider putting on a set of slicks unless they want to put on another set of wet tyres. But well, there's an interesting way to come into the pit lane. Oh, you drive it in, you don't actually uh, with the, put the dollies under it, then they, they rotate it. Well, that's a novel way of doing it. I haven't seen that happen previously. There we have track temperature 16.9, ambient 17, humidity 89. Well, that means it's raining. Oh, it's not raining now, it's dropped 88.5. It happens, it's happening as we speak, John. So let's just run down the charts. It's two Lamborghinis at the top of the chart. There you see it, 63 ahead of 563. So for the Grasser Racing Team, at least they're putting one back over the FFF Racing Team, the newcomer team. And Nico Bastian, the best of the Mercedes runners, third fastest. Lucas Stoltz, always up there in his Black Falcon Mercedes, is fourth. Then the two Aston Martins, Dero Venio, Ricky Collard, Ezekiel Perez, compact, the number one Audi, we've seen him. And Rick Broeker is quite slow to set a time, but the young Dutch ace up into eighth fastest. The number two Audi, that's Charles Wirtz, that's the young gun right at the sharp end of the first of two races at Mizano. Had a little bit of a spin, made no mistakes to take that first victory in the second race. And but he, he really is a name for now, not for the future. Uh, he, I tell you, after he got out of the car, he was buzzing. He was, first of all, delighted to take victory. Probably more delighted not to have made another, you know, what might be described as loosely a schoolboy error. And he isn't much older than a schoolboy. Yeah, he but turned... it was a mistake that was part of the learning curve. He was leading the race at the time it occurred. He's got tons and tons of ability, and now he's got to learn to channel that into a way wherein he uses that natural ability and speed along this weekend with Christopher Mies. Difference is Christopher Mies and Charles Verts. There's quite a lot of difference in stature, put it that way. Yeah, so Charles. Charles at the pit stop have a bet, well, it shouldn't do because they just have seat inserts. Yeah, Charles, Charles, forget, don't forget last year, only stepped up from racing Formula 4 right at the end of the season. We were so impressed with the Nations Cup in Bahrain when he, he put it right at the front end of the field and he's really maturing but right now a driver who doesn't need to mature a driver who's done it all been there seen it done it most notably in Lamborghinis Mirko Bortolotti but suddenly he's got a challenger because Lucas Stoltz has moved in close behind a third of a second down now the blue number four Mercedes from the Black Falcon team second quickest now splitting the Lamborghinis to the top of the chart so we've had the run of pit stops we've got the drivers back out you can see the clock is accelerating down to just under six minutes remaining who's going to be at the top at the end of this session the 63 Lamborghini to my eyes slowing almost stopping well he's doing he's just looking for yeah. track position because he's going to go on to a flying lap at the conclusion this is done at this very tight hands so hands urged the pop in other words hands urged corner but what I want to know is when we saw a car was at the Aston Martin having its wheels and tyres removed, it looks here you might maybe get away with running something approximating to a slick tyre. But as long as you're getting a little wisp, now you can see the difference in the line that the Lamborghini's on and offline, which is clearly damp. So it might now be conceivable that this is going to be. Well, he's running off to the right to get onto the wetter part of the track, so I'm assuming that he is still on instead of wet in that case. Certainly looks fairly confident turning into Tarzan, a corner that keeps on going around. And then this very narrow, this is almost the narrowest feeling part of the track behind the, t yep. the paddock. And then it twists around and into the dip at uh, Hugenholzbocht. And then it gets fired out oh, so close to the little isthmus that leads you into the paddock. Then accelerating up the slope and over towards the wonderful twisters that take you out towards Schaeffler. And here we go, here we go. The rolling racetrack through the sand 
flat out up the hill, blind press, and all of a sudden then the racetrack just dives away from you to the right. You get the car in the compression, there's the compression, and you feel it in your body, then you raise out, and all of a sudden you get up to turn 11. Where did turn 10 go? I didn't see where turn 10 was. But turn 10 was the corner you come out of. So, yes, we thought maybe the Aston Martin was going in slicks, but clearly one of the centre lock. I think it's a Phoenix racing out This Vegas is the one there. that uh, Kim Lewis Schramm sharing this weekend with Jean Carl Verne. We'll come on to Verne coming into the championship this weekend. But uh, it's a roll of the dice, but they've been looking at the times on the screens. Aro Venio out on circuit, sixth fastest at the moment. He just banged in the fastest first sector of anybody. It's still Mirko Bortolotti at the time at the top of the charts. We saw the Aston Mark up on the stands and uh, just looking to see. So it may well be that that. Uh, Aston Martin is currently on set of slick tyres, but it is very marginal. I think on certain parts of the racetrack, you need to be careful because the track is still offering up a lot of moisture and coming through this final turn, turn 20, onto start finish straight. There you can see how much spray is coming up from the rear. So that was the Arik Leyendijk bot. And that was Arik Leyendijk, one of many famous Dutch race drivers, particularly in North America. OK, Mirko Bortolotti extends his advantage, but let's go down to Dries van Tor down in the pits with Dakota. Dries, there's a fantastic race last race in Mazzano. Is it going to be the same here? The weather conditions look a little bit iffy today. Yeah, it's raining. Oh, no, it's not raining at the moment, but it's wet. So, uh, yeah, it's tricky. It's, we only have one lap here, even on rain tyres now as well, we see. So it's going to be tricky. Who has uh, the most rain tyres for this qualifying, I guess, because, uh, yeah, we only have one lap, so... We have to use the peak out of that lap, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. As you said, you're on rain tyres right now. Do you think there could be a possible dry line out there? Well, I hope. I mean, I hope actually because... Because you like being on the dry. Cars on the, on the grid um, and it's not raining anymore, but it's tricky. It doesn't dry up that fast here, but yeah, let's hope it's going to be dry because it's more fun. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you very much. Reece. Thank you very much, Dakota. And while that was happening, Andrea Caldarelli moved up into second place as points 0 0.03 of a second down on Mirko Bortolotti. So it's the two Lamborghinis at the top of the chart. And uh, Dries's car, the number one Audi, in the hands of Ezekiel Perez Compank, just out from the pits. Ninth place overall, second best of the Audis, but it's uh, two Lamborghinis. This is the second fastest one. 5.63, Andrea Caldarelli from the three Mercedes and then the best of the Audis. And it's, it's really sort of fingertip stuff. As you come through these sweeping curves in the middle of the circuit, the circuit is got into winds. So now exiting turn 13, down the straight ish, sort of straight. Then there's a, that crest that you break downhill, and it's a difficult breaking downhill because if you don't anticipate your braking zone and you then see where the corn, you may overrun it. So down at turn 16 and 17, you've just got to be slow in and quick out then into what I think is one of the better corners, the, the Kumo Bok. This corner, this penultimate corner on the racetrack, which sets you up then for Ari Leyendijk, the Bok. I was saying, it was Bok, I said, it wasn't anything else. You did indeed, but uh, yeah, a corner there, now there's keeps the on tightening. I think that car may be on Stilix. We did see the 62 Aston Martin has dropped down to seventh place, and that's because I think it is on slick tyres and everybody else around has stayed on to wet time. And I was about to say, let's look at the 76 Aston Martin instead, and that's just gone up to fourth place, Ricky Collard. He's now six tenths of a second down. He's right on the time of Lucas Stoltz, who's third, but it's still the Lamborghini's first and second ahead of this, the number four Black Falcon Mercedes. But times are changing, and uh, let's see what the number one Audi can do. At the moment, we've got a big spread of time back to Mauro Ricci, but the Mercedes are the team, the drivers that are starting to make the move. Felipe Fraga up in the mix, but certainly the Aston Martins coming very, very strong indeed. Nico Bastian also going well. Yeah, it's a Sky Stein short horse is the first of the numerous Audis. Audi is the most popular brand here this weekend in Zandvoort. It's only in fifth place, and it's just under a second away from Merkel Portal Lobby's current provisional time of just less than well, six seconds of the session remaining so you're on your lap you can complete it and that lap will count and out comes the end of the checkered flag the end of this first qualifying session a whole host of drivers in fact every driver bar one out on the circuit the only one is Renat Salikov not in 
And uh, Felipe Frago, good lap from him. He puts him sixth fastest for the ACA ASP team, but uh, only ninth for Vincent Abril at the moment. Where's the next improvement going to come from? So the Mercedes just not be able to match the ultimate pace. So certainly not the ACA ASP Mercedes. This one, the Black Falcon car, has just been on super form all season. Ironically, it's the car behind Nico Bastian, who's now been allowed to go through. The controls have pulled over, but Nico Bastian will have felt that I was inhibited for maybe three or four corners, but Nico Bastian, who is currently down in seventh place, had been up in third place earlier in the session, probably would feel, and with justification, had I gotten through the number four Black Falcon Mercedes, I could have made further progress. You can see Bastian coming onto the start finish line. But 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 I mentioned Vance and Abril only in ninth place. He just banged in the fastest first sector. The vast majority of his rivals have completed their qualifying, including the 63 car. Mirko Bortolotti on pole, but will he stay stay there? As Abril could have timed it to perfection at the end of this session in the 88 Mercedes. So Mirko will be smiling, but knowing him, he'll be straight in to look at the timing screens. He'll be aware that whoever's the last one on the track has a very good opportunity, not just because the track's drying but also because there will not be any traffic ahead of them. But here comes the 88 car, turned from blue to red last time out to improve its form. It was hoped for the ASP team at Mizano. Should be able to complete the, the lap without any further interruption. Fastest in sector one, fastest in sector two. Looks like he's going to take pole position by half a second and more. Time to perfection by Vincent Abril. The checkered flag is out, the checkered flag is waving. Will he go top? Wait two seconds, it's number 63 Lamborghini at the top of the charts. No longer, Vincent Abril goes clear by precisely half a second. So and, and, you know, that's the joy and the frustration of qualifying or even racing in these changeable conditions. And Drea Caldarelli is probably a little bit disappointed because he was at this provisional front row of the grid. Now he's been demoted down to the second row of the grid, but no real big deal. But there's a clear case of good timing on the part of the 88 Mercedes advance on a drill delivered by over half a second to take that pole position. Nothing provisional about it. He is the man in the 88 who will start the first of these two sprint rounds that position. Uh, Vincent is a driver who never can keep his emotions within him, so he'll be bubbling, but he'll have to do the, the main job, which is to pass that information over to his teammate, to Raffaele Marcello. they have got a short period before the second session. You can see all the drivers talking. That's Marco Mapelli with Andrea Caldarelli in the background. There's Phil Keane who shares, with, but it's all about sharing that information, the knowledge where the track is at its best, or more to the point, where it's at its worst, John. Yes, indeed, and I mean, that information, and they're handing it over to the fellow drivers within the FFF. F1 Lamborghini team just well that information is quite clear wait oh, no. towards the end of the session indeed and I mean, the only issue in saying that is that if you go out to the very start of the session you establish a time as we look down Bruce at the times from that Q1 session. Well, it was super close at the top, just uh, 0.03 of a second until that final car over the start finish line. Van Sanabril banging in a half second ahead of Mirko Bortolotti, timed it to perfection as the track continued to dry. Real mix of manufacturers at the top end. It looks like it was going to be a Lamborghini 1-2, but we have the Mercedes on top. And the Mercedes that had been best place is shifted back into fourth place overall. Ricky Collard looked very strong indeed in the Aston Martin in the closing session seconds of that session but it really was a case of tight getting the timing right and having your car set up for a track that uh, is wet but even by the moment i think is now drying out the rain that fell just before the session certainly made it very difficult indeed uh, for the drivers in the first half of that 20 minute qualifying session session number two coming up very very soon indeed but uh, right now hats off to the aka asp mercedes team for timing it to perfection Well, track conditions, I would say, will continue to improve. The cloud base, which has been hovering low over the racetrack pretty much since you got here this morning, Bruce. Fortunately, I was a little bit later getting in. Uh, beginning to rise and break up. The wind's still there. That's good. The wind will help blow away the moisture. The interesting thing about Zandvoort, and of course, the Netherlands, or Holland as we would call it in the UK, is that the majority of this nation is below the sea level. The only thing that saves Zandvoort, the racetrack, from being underwater 90% of the time is that it is built amongst the sand dunes and you've got very good drainage. Interesting to see Nico Bastian being quite lively down in the pit oh, lane there. Oh, no, no, sorry, what's your comment on my bit of, you know... Homework, your oh, yeah, bit of homework? Yeah, yeah. I was going to come back to it later, I was... Uh, oh, OK. <laughs> you floored me there, John, for a second. 
Andrea Bertolini doing very, very well in the in the Pro-Am class, racing with uh, Louis Machiels and all trying to score points uh, for the Blancpain GT World Challenge. We have Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe. It's qualifying session number two coming up soon. Series in Asia, Series in America. The manufacturers Ferrari and uh, Mercedes have nominated four drivers in each of those championships, and certainly Bertolini and Michels have been scoring very good points for Ferrari indeed in the European Championship. At the end of the year, we'll do the sums, add it all up, but uh, it's certainly a new feature for 2019 to tie those all together, running alongside the Blancpain Endurance Series. And uh, for all the drivers, it's, uh, it's an added twist in the tale. Whether really hovering around where it was about 20 minutes ago. Ambient and track have come up maybe about half a degree. And the expectation of improvement in ambient temperature particularly is not great. It's going to maybe get up to about 19, maybe 20 Celsius at, at the best early afternoon. So we've got this trick, tricky, tricky, difficult, slick, semi-wet, semi-dry track conditions. Yeah, changing all the time, but a driver who got the changing conditions just right. Vance and Abril. Vince, well done. You got it just right, as the, the commentators said. You were absolutely shaking. I can feel you from here shaking. What's that about? Yeah, those are the qualifyings you, you kind of live for. Um, very tricky out there. The track is very cold. Uh, it was just like some lines that was dry. I told the team, look, let's let's go for slicks because I think it was the cutoff point. Uh, we were really close to it, but it's a close, it's a tight point. <laughs> But the guys nailed it. They did a, a great pit stop during the, the actual quality. And uh, I just crossed the line a couple of seconds before the flag. And I'm super happy because it's been a long time uh, to be on pole in such a tough championship. It feels really good. The momentum is back in the team. We had a, sorry for the word, but we had a shit start of the season. And uh, it's just our time now. It's our time. You guys had an immaculate timing with this qualifying session. Is it going to be the same style for Rafi? He's got to match you now. Yeah, well, we know Rafael. You know what he can do. And uh, I'm sure he's going to do his best. I think it's going to be much sim simpler now because uh, now it's dry. There's a dry line out there. And with the wind, it's going to be it's going to be slicks for everyone. So yeah, very happy. Very Thanks happy. for the info. Congratulations. OK, thank you, Vitakota. Apologies for the language there, but as you could observe, Vincent Abril was just chock full, full of adrenaline there because he knew he had to deliver, got it right, the team got it right. And uh, yes, again, apologies for the language, but uh, a job very well done. And now, as he pointed out, the dr drivers in session two, easy job, the track's getting dry for them. Track is changing. It's not yet dry, but it is changing. There's an interesting insight into the front suspension of Marcus Finkelhock. And the Sanderlock Racing again, Marcus Finkelhock, who I would anticipate will be up amongst the leading Audi drivers in this session. We didn't see much from the idea was that it was Scott Schoenhorst's car that was actually the quickest of all those Audis. And you know, then you've got a gaggle around about 10 down to 15 or 16. So maybe Zandvoort isn't going to be good for Audi, or maybe they just didn't dial the car into the particular, the nuance of the track surface and the general conditions. Jimmy Plough, somebody to keep an eye on in the Pro-Am. In one of the Aka ASP Mercedes. Yeah, they're lined up just beneath our commentary position. But uh, cars that can look quite bright in the dark morning at Zandvoort. It's been grey, but it is getting brighter. The car that was fastest of all. It used to be dark blue, but changed to red for Mizano. And uh, certainly a car to look out for now, because Van San Abril has taken pole for race number one. Can the tall man, the tall Italian, Raffaele Marcello, the driver who absolutely goes crazy when it starts racing. Get, you know, he, he enjoys the racing the best, but I think he also quite fancy the pleasure of taking pole position for race number two. But Aston Martin very much in the mix as well. And Marvin Kirchhofer, a driver who just seems to get better and better, John. Yes, and a car also that, you know, at varying points during the season, and this is a, quite a different car from the car that our motorsport were running last year. This year, they've got the twin turbo AMG based V8 engine rather than the venerable V12 Aston Martin, of course, that engine goes back almost many decades and has now been superseded by a much more contemporary twin turbo V8. Christopher Meese strapping himself in to the number two car he's sharing with Charles Betts. Christopher Meese, always a driver in an Audi who just knows nothing else than delivery. Well, actually, quite strange, John. As you said, strapping in, he just climbed out of the car. So maybe he's deciding to go for the later run, let some of the other drivers drive the session, but slicks are the way yeah. to go. That's Mattia Drudi, second generation. Father Luca was a very good Formula 3 racer, but good pairing with Milan Donce, one of the home drivers. It'll be an early morning wake-up call for any driver who's not been on track, as these drivers in Q2 are going to be, to go out on a set of slicks. 
probably, even though you've now got just under 20 minutes of this session, I would want to send my driver out on a set of wet weather tyres for a couple of exploratory laps to see where the track, because you're not going to get your best lap, even if you're on slicks at the beginning of the session, assuming it doesn't rain, it's going to be at the back end of the session. So why put on a brand new set of slicks unless you've got plenty of them lying around and you're just going to use them up? Nevertheless, my view would be go out on a set of wets, even if you do one lap and come straight back in, at least you will know where the wet line or the dry line or where the blend line of the two is. I think so too. Right, just had a sighting there of the Lexus, Panis Bartes racing, and as you can see, twitching away, there's already still spray out on the, on the well, there's, uh, there's lenses. Spots, yeah, there's spots on the lens of the camera, and that's why I would have been, unless you do it with uh, you know, one of the more senior or more experienced of the, the drivers, again, as the cars go out into the sand dunes, you can see more spray and spotting on the camera lens again, more options. Fred Vavish, now, Fred is a very experienced driver, and he will have many on many occasions, and they're making an adjustment to the front, is it, is it a front damper setting or is it a ride height setting? I think that's just Fred using his experience it all is. the years of racing yeah, around they're making, here. They're making a suspension change, either they're adjusting the ride height, it looks more to me like they're making an adjustment on the ride height. The yeah, trio of Audis makes their way around turn at 10. Well, in fact, it's a Ferrari at the front of that queue, just largely keeping out of the way there, but uh, we will see how that fares later on, but the majority of these drivers doing exactly as you suggested. That was the HP Racing Ferrari, by the way. And uh, just having an exploratory lap, but I think you're absolutely right, John. What does it hurt as long as your crew are pretty handy? Go, go out on wets, get the feel for the car, and then come back in. And yesterday they had a wet session and a dry session, so at least they had that experience, but this is intermediate conditions. What we're trying to second guess is what is the weather going to do? Whether the teams are aware that there may be more rain coming in on the next 17 or so minutes, so that might be why people have gone early on the set of sticks. But you can see Maro Engel, he almost, almost got caught coming out of turn five. Still work going on in the pits, just one of the Audis sitting in there, bright yellow on the side, the number two well, that's car. That's Christopher B's car. Yeah, that's, he got out, we saw him in the cockpit, he's got out. Rain on the camera lens in the pits, so it's not just out the far end of the circuit. And bear in mind, John, in the first session, as the drivers are standing in the back of the garage having a chat, was, uh, that's Rick Broikers having a chat as well. The main part of the rain was in the final third of the circuit, particularly when they were coming to start, finish straight. But now they're still a little bit drifting around in the pits. What they're doing, trying to do something within the cockpit, but it's down in the pedal region. So what is the problem? It's hard to judge from that camera angle to, to see, but clearly time lost for the number two RD, especially in these kind of weather conditions. And three spot four in the number one, you can see the wipers going. Now that's not going just for fashion reasons, that's going because there is rain falling. Yeah, well, Dries is probably going to be one of the earlier cars to set a flying lap. He set some very good intermediate sectors around the lap, but the driver really getting the pace going is Michele Beretta, the number 19 Lamborghini, one of three. Uh, two entered by the Grasser Racing Team, waiting to see when these uh, sectors get added together and become a flying lap. But Dries went top pushing very, very hard indeed. John, you were talking earlier about body language. You were looking at Mirko well, Portolotti in the first session, and Dries is super positive. He's committed, big time committed. And I think that they believe that the weather is again going to change from that period when it stopped raining. We well, didn't see the wipers still. Out. I mean, I don't think he's forgotten to turn them off. The reason he's got them on is because there must be a, a, a small amount of rain in the air and he wants to complete this lap. I'm assuming he's on a set of slick tires. He wants to, to crack a lap before the track itself starts to drop away in terms of what it's going to give up on lap time. Well, his time in the first sector alone as Matteo Drudy goes to the top of the charts is quicker than anybody else by about three tenths of a second. He needs that HP Racing Ferrari to stay out of the way. They're not running. They are in the same race, but it's way quicker than the AM class Ferrari. The Ferrari beautifully keeps towards the outside of the circuit. Dries doesn't want any confusion. He's just banged in the fastest middle sector of anyone. He will go top as long as he's not interrupted. This is the final corner. No interruption at all. Even using the slipstream down the start finish straight will come out the target time, 1 minute 42.988 Eight seconds. How fast did Dries manage? 1 minute 41.356, 1.6 second quicker. So that was a super committed. The clock break keeps it's counting it's down its break. Break problems, problem. It? And they're pumping away. Now, whether these cars, of course, they run an ABS system, whether it is a simply just a, a break between the pedal and the, the calipers, or whether that's involving the ABS system, certainly that's, that, is, that is a lot of frustration for that car.
and it was the left front they were seemingly working on mostly now the body is they can be attached quick snap fits but you know john if you've got a driver who who can fight back in limited time who knows the audi who knows the circuits christopher Meese, christopher Meese is one of your men to do that yes task. i agree but you can see even the camera and the pit lane has got rain on the sled so track conditions are not currently improving from what i can see and we're waiting just to see any further improvement as you rough early mark Giello, having said that has now gone overall quickest by two tenths of a second. Very, very tight at the top. Marcello by 0.2 of a second ahead of Mac Marco Mapelli, Timo Volkoschleifsky, the second the Acura ASP Mercedes, and David Perel, top in the Pro Am class in the Ferrari, goes at fourth fast. It's just three tenths of a second down, but Dries Van Torre is going better than anybody in the first sector of lap number two. 1.3 seconds up on the ultimate pace, really, really fast in that first sector. Wait and see, no improvement in the middle sector, but with that. 1.3 second gain in sector one. He's bound to go back to the top of the charts. Helman van der Linde. Yeah, the number 66. Out if you saw Steinschott horse going really well for Tempto Racing in the first session. And now Kelvin, sorry, it was Kevin Schmidt he shares with a bigger part, different, different car. But Dries van Tor goes top. He's quickest by a mere one and a half seconds in the number one Audi. I mean, literally now, assuming you've, you've got the, 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 the quicker cars, the, the normal sort of usual suspects, as they're coming up to complete their laps, they're just about managing to get the level of grip because there is that very, very fine little spray of rain that is is falling. So Dries Van Four has done a stunning time, 139.3 to nine. The only driver so far Saturday morning at Zandvoort in the sand dunes on a semi-wet grab. What more can I say? Who's broken the one minute? 40 second, the 100 second barrier. It's all in the detail, John, but Raffaele Marcello is definitely doing good detail. He's banged it a very fast time, but Christian Engelhardt is about to say, look for the Lamborghinis. Engelhardt was going very well in the early part of the lap, manifested itself. He's quarter of a second clear from Dries van Dorp. Kelvin van der Linde in third, was third. It's changed again because Raffaele Marcello decided he needs to move to the top. A tenth of a second clear from Engelhardt. Dries van Dorp going faster again this lap, but uh, he's actually been outpaced in the early section of the lap. Nick Foster down in eighth place overall, just set the Fastest first section of anyone. He's now ninth. The times are changing at the top. It's Mercedes with Marcello. Christian Engelhardt, second for Lamborghini. Third, Dries van Thor. And then fourth place, Michele Beretta. But, I mean, but Lexus up into fifth place. Jack Hawksworth. Absolutely. Look for that one. Not surprised about Jack Hawksworth. Very quick driver indeed. But what is wonderful for us and for the comment of the, our spectators and audiences at back home is this is fantastic qualifying. But it is absolutely a nightmare for everybody in the grid because they just set a pull time and all of a sudden, bang, you're down to 10th place in the space of one lap. And Dries van Thor has now over six tenths of a second improvement on Raffaele Marcello's as we look at Charles Fertz. So he is in the number two car. And that's the car we have seen in the pit. And we wonder, has that car yet? You know what, Christopher Hauser. No, we're waiting for Christopher Mies to go out and Christopher, Mies, Christopher Mies, Hauser hasn't set a flying no, time, but at least, Mies, he's out, at least he's out on the circuit. But Christian Engelhard is starting to wind up the car that's fourth fastest at the moment. He's done the fastest first sector of anyone. He needs to find a seven tenths of a second. Nick Foster, I said, he had a good old time and he has moved into second place overall in your Tempto Racing Audi. Christian Engelhardt now currently in fifth place and he may well be on that provisional. He's not his third quickest. So Engelhardt didn't quite make it onto the provisional front row. It's Nick Foster, second quickest in the Audi. Dries Van Four fastest in the Audi. All of a sudden, Audi have come forward. They didn't do quite as well in Q1. Q2 is an entirely different story. Yeah, five of the top ten runners in Audi. Jean-Carl Vernet, new to the championship this weekend. He's tenth fastest. He's arrived for the Phoenix Racing uh, crew this weekend with Kim Lewis Schramm. The Aston Martin's not in the mix. Marvin Kirchhofer here is 11th fastest moment, down to 12th. The time's changed. Suddenly, Hugo de Sadelier has moved up into fourth place in the other Aston Martin. Christopher Mies up to sixth and on another lap and currently fastest overall. Sorry, Christopher Hasler. Christopher Mies is still in the pit lane or... He has done an outlap, but come in and Christopher East, that number two, has yet to record a time with 10 minutes of this session to go. We looked at the Aston Martin, Hugo de Saladier went up to fifth, suddenly Mark, Marvin Kirchhofer goes into third, so the Aston Martin's right in the mix. The driver charging is Christopher Haas at the Santa Lock 25. Uh, Audi, here it is on screen, seventh on the timesheets at the moment, but fastest in sector one, fastest in sector two. We're going to maybe get close to the one minute 36s for a lap. That would be remarkable. A track that is clearly driving, drying very, very quickly, but you've got to be on slicks, you've got to be on it, is the simple answer. Well, a 136 was the lap time set in the bronze test yesterday. That was the 
Christopher House has just now achieved that. That was a time set by the number one of Dries Van Thor and Ezekiel Perez compact, 136.892. So Christopher House at 137, just a tenth and a bit away. But conditions when that time was set were in roughly mid-morning Friday, and while there was a lot of rain in the air, it was still a dry racetrack. Car number 90's had one of its times cancelled for exceeding track limits. I think we've been off at various points there. We've got to watch it, but Dries Van Torre is keeping it on the black stuff. It's the Santelot Racing Team at the top of the charts. We're halfway through this 20-minute qualifying session. The best lap, 1 minute 37.006 seconds for Christopher Haas. Dries Van Torre, not his best middle sector, but he's just set the fastest opening sector. But then that's been changed because the Santelot car has responded and uh, gone even faster in the opening sector. So Christopher Haas is the pace driver right now. Dries Van Torre is doing the chasing in that number one Audi. Again, slightly held back by his middle sector of the lap. Will he improve? Will he get into one minute 36s? He's a third of a second down on the ultimate pace by Christopher Haas. I'm waiting for that time to come through. Yes, he does, one minute 36.5, the fastest time we've had all meeting. His teammate, Ezekiel Perez Compact, glad to be back and glad to see his number one Audi fastest, but will it stay at the top of the charts? So Ezekiel Perez compact with an even pushier beard than he had before he had to go away for that medical period when he was having his uh, vertebrae. There's going to be a change at the top, because Chris Mahal surely yes. will go to the top. Let's just wait and see. Dries Van Tor did a 1 minute 36.584, 1 minute 36.650, so held back in that final sector. He's under a tenth of a second down, but second rather than first, though, for Team WRT. They have the bragging rights, but I feel the track gets dry. We've got eight and a bit minutes remaining. It's going to keep on changing at the top. Well, we're waiting to see where the, the, the 88 Mercedes is. Right now, it's in 17th place. And the reason is it's in 17th place is because they've been in the pit lane. They've been waiting. There's now we've got seven minutes remaining. Will we see the 88 Mercedes go out when the track looks? Now you can see a definitively light grey, which is the, the dry line coming through turns 19 and 20. So will we see the 88 Mercedes? Will we see the 90 Mercedes? Will we see other cars that wear very much in the front? Christopher Beast has now actually recorded a lap, currently only 19th, but that's the first flying lap for that number two car. Times keep on changing, but at the very front end, it's those two Audis, Dries Van Tor from Christopher Haas. Mauro Engel has just improved to third place, but he's six tenths of a second down. Suddenly, it really is looking very, very good indeed for the Audi crews. David Perel still fourth for Ferrari. Christopher Meese was down at 19th, up to seventh place on the second flying lap. But that's on a car that's got a, almost a brand new set of tyres compared to those that have been running and running and running, just trying to maintain temperature and trying to find the, the, the drying part of every corner around for 20 turns here in Zandvoort. Right, the pit lane getting busy. Dries Van Tor's in, he's sitting on that provisional lead, but it's only 0.066 of a second. It is getting brighter by the moment at Zandvoort. Even little breaks in the clouds suggesting a blue sky beyond, but that won't help this session too much. David Perel, the South African racer who watched GT racing, from his home in Cape Town, decided he wanted to go. He came over and competed in the Italian GT. Didn't have the money, but he'd been kept under the wing of uh, Rinaldi Racing and now leading the Pro-Am class, fourth overall, just having a fantastic run here at Zambor. He's, he's certainly monstered the curbs coming down into Hans Ernst Bock. He was very aggressive on the right hand of the entry into the chicane. Not necessarily the beneficial way of doing it, but he's on a run and he might well, he's coming in fourth position, 137.4. He improves up to third place at 137.0. So in spite of monstering the curb, he's fine, what, well, the best part of half a second. Well, you have to take your hat off because uh, you wouldn't normally expect to see David Perel in the top 10. Anything in the top 10 would be great, but third fastest at the moment. It's about being brave, but it's about having commitment, but just maybe staying that little bit back. But someone who's not staying that little bit back, brilliant middle sector. Oh, actually came into the pits from yeah, it. Maro Engel. Maro Engel. Indeed. It's like putting a stopwatch on the car. They never come round again. So the number one Audi, fastest of all at the moment, Dries Van Tor is in the pits. He's going to have a fresh set of rubber. And again, little changes, but the clock continues to count down. Five and a half minutes remaining. So it's getting pretty tight out there. It's going to be, as we said before, John, possibly the last driver over the start finish line. That's the number 26 Audi. I mean, again, there's, there's, we saw this in the number, the Christopher House of the number two Audi working around the front, whether it was suspension, certainly in the case of Christopher Mies, it looked to be a brake issue. So yep. is that a brand new set of drive where the stick tires has gone on to the 26 and to give Marcus Winkelhock currently in 10th position 1.6 seconds away from the provisional pole. Raffaele Marciello has now slotted the 88 Mercedes into that position and he's a quarter of a second again now ahead of Dries Van Thor who is in the pits 
and no doubt with what four and a half minutes to do four and a half minutes to go he will be back on track one last roll of the dice well Acker ASP have played it very well in both sessions but one thing that just changed as the cars left the pits they look different now they look bright the sun is coming through here at where? Zandvoort where John John look out the back window of the commentary booth it is getting brighter by the moment but uh, the cars look at their very best Ries van Tor though his doesn't look the very best because it's not the fastest only the fastest car watch, ever looks brilliant watch the 63 Lamborghini all the way down in 21st position Christian Engelhardt Passes through sector one on a lap. Yeah, that there just shows the schism. He's two point, nearly 2.3 seconds down on the ultimate pace. This pace set by Jim Pla now, top for Aka ASP. One minute 36.240. I'm not sure that was in the script for Aka ASP, but this, don't forget. This is going to be good enough to get him onto at least the second row of the grid. Yeah, I just want to blow Jim Pla's trumpet. He races in a pro am lineup. He shares either with uh, Jean Luc Bobelik or Mara Ritchie, but uh, the fact he's shown that he very much is a pro, he's fastest. So it's Aka ASP one and two. Where does the Lamborghini go? Number 63 goes short. To the, just waiting to see yes. it's at the top of the charts. The typing screen was slow. 1 minute 36.011 seconds. Clear by two tenths of a second. So it's Lamborghini back to the top. Three and a half minutes remaining. Who else is making a move? Number Phil Keen sharing with Hiroshi Hamaguchi, also running in the Pro Am class. So now he's moved up to ninth. So we have three Pro Am cars, four Pro Am cars as Andrea Bertolini goes into tenth in the top ten. But with a lot of the Pro Pro line of drivers, driver lineups coming out for this final bash this final run at the end of the second qualifying session all that is sure to change it's a very very busy racetrack one car that i'm wondering where it's gone to because christian engelhardt has gone fastest over he was 11th a lap ago christian engelhardt is now quickest overall 136.011 the changes are coming thick and fast you almost don't look from timing screens and moving images but Christopher Haas through the Sandslot racing number 25 Audi down in fifth place at the moment 0.6 of a second down on the ultimate pace just banged in the fastest first sector of anyone that target keeps on moving isn't this a TV director's nightmare where do I go which camera 12 no 7 2 8 10 yeah well it's exactly the same looking at the timing screens Sandslot racing Leading the way in the Audi, you know this, of course, second in the Audi charge because Team WRT, the number one car, is fastest of all. Matthias Drudy down in 17th place, just put together his fastest sector times because easily moved way up the charts, falls to 18th, crosses the start finish line. This is how fast things are changing. Wait for the time to come up on the screen. Quickest, Bang! quickest, fastest unbelievable. Brilliantly picked out. There were no purple sector times, pinky purple. He was down by oh, half a tenth of a second in the opening stint, so well done for picking that but one Christopher up. But Christopher has just gone and beaten that time of course by he has. three tenths of a second. This is fantastic. I could do this all the time. Two minutes remaining. So the Mercedes went to the top of the charts. The best Mercedes, Jim Pla, now down in fourth place. It's the Audis of Christopher Haas and Matthias Drudy at the top of the chart. You've still got time to do it all over again. Christian Engelhardt, the best of the Lamborghini runners. The best Aston Martin in sixth place, Marvin Kirchhofer. I'll be able to read you a totally different list in a few moments' time. The final two minutes of qualifying, John. Absolutely well, fantastic. I mean, I, I just wondered if when Attempt to Racing woke up, did they think they would have a car that would, with, what, a minute and 40 to go would be on the provisional front row of the grid alongside the Santa Lock Racing Christopher Hauser, 76 Aston Martin Marvin Kehofer, currently in sixth place. Personal best, Sector 1, but it's Dries Van 4, who's one position behind in seven, who's gone fastest overall in Sector 1. So Dries Van Thor, with a minute and 20 to go, has not given up any chance of taking that pole position back again. Well, Marvin Kirchhofer there, just getting a little bit wrong, clonking the kerbs, front end of the car, almost off the road. They're pushing on in the number 76, Aston Martin. He's down in seventh place. This was a good lap in the opening sector, but it's the speed of Dries Van Thor in the number one Audi. We really have to watch his first sector. Absolutely remarkable, under 42 seconds, which, trust me, Middle sector, not brilliant. Maybe had traffic, maybe, I don't know. So Dries Van Thor now in the final turn, turn 20. Ari Larendijk Pot comes on the start, finish straight. Nice clean exit, no unnecessary movement. Can this get that number one Audi back into provisional pole with 40 seconds remaining? No, it doesn't. It remains fourth quickest. Yeah, moved up from eighth to fourth. That's how far it fell down to eighth place, up to fourth, but three tenths of a second clear. Christopher Hasser in the number 25 Santalot Racing Audi is sitting pretty at the moment into the final minute. Here comes Dries Van Tor. He can do it all over again. Let's see what his first sector time is as he sweeps around, waiting for that to come up on the clock, but he doesn't appear to have traffic. This surely is his chance. And how about the Black Falcon Mercedes? Always in the mix, but right now, being 17th is not in the mix for Mauro Engel. There it is. Mauro Engel, now he can complete the slap. 
Czech flag is going to probably going to fall just at the point he, he may have gotten across the line before the flag came out. I'm not telling us, very, 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 very close to Mario Engel. Go second. Up. Second position. Okay. So yeah. all of a sudden, again, staying out last man before the flag falls normally has the best opportunity. We didn't see the beginning of the lap from Mario Engel, but he got the job done. Well, he split the Audis that were at the front. Christopher Haas and Matthias Drudy instead of first and second are now first and third. So Mario Engel up into second place. Don't know yet whether he just got onto a final flyer, but certainly that move from outside the top ten up into second, very, very useful indeed. Who else is making improvements? Fred Vervish, we saw him a little bit delayed. He's gone up, not yet in the top ten. But Christopher Meese, at least with all the delay early on, is into the top ten in tenth overall. And a lot of the drivers taking this chequered flag still think Mauro Engel has uh, just managed to do the job. Can't guarantee that, though. So we're watching him moved up to second place, but at the moment... I think he managed second. to get across the line before the flag fell, maybe by only a second. He's still on a lap. David Perel, likewise, in the 333 Ferrari. He's dropped down. He's second in class, down in 12th position. Jimmy Pla is in thick. He's leading now. He's coming into the pit lane anyway, so it's somewhat academic. So it depends where you are, whether the question is whether the number four Mercedes came across the line before the flag fell or was it literally the two things coincided. So in effect, set qualifying Q2 is complete. Yeah, and we did have a change while we were just talking there. Dries Van Tor slotted into second place. He went from eighth to fourth to second, fastest final section of anyone, but ended up 0.156 of a second short of fellow Audi team. But of course, the Santalok Audi team, top of the charts, Christopher Haas. And there's Evietz looking to see what his son's car has done. Ended up 10th overall in the hands of Christopher Mies. So at least satisfaction they got in the top 10. What might have been, who can tell, but they got the work done in a very short order down at Team WRT. But it just goes to show the expectations now for Evietz, for his boy, are right at the very sharp end. Indeed. And, I mean, just to go back and... Oh, 20 minutes of just non-stop excitement. Drying sessions are always fantastic to be involved in, other than if you're a driver or a team principal, because you, you just don't know. And it's a roll of the dice, and... If you can get it correct, then you will end up being the beneficiary. And Chris Mahasa has done that for Santa Lock Racing. Certainly did. Timed it absolutely to perfection. It looks as though Dries Van Tor had the job done, but the names at the top of the chart kept on changing. But it's two Audis at the top. Christopher Haas for 25 Santa Lock Racing team, and then Belgian Audi Club Team WRT. Number one in second place, Mauro Engel. Just looks so he timed it to perfection in the Black Falcon Mercedes. He ends up third, but a real hats off moment for Matthias Drudy going hugely well for Tempto Racing to be fourth. Christian Engelhardt looks so like he might have done it as well in his Lamborghini. Jim Pla, top pro-am runner in sixth overall. And Raffaele Marcello, in turn, it changed so much. We thought he got to the top of the charts. He did, but he ended up seventh. So that is how things kept on changing. And uh, for all the drivers, they'll dissect that qualifying session and think, could we have gone out 20 seconds earlier and just managed to get on one more flying lap? That was how fast the track was changing. But uh, the fact I think we didn't even have a spinner showed the mastery of a circuit that was damp at the start. It was drying, but of course, they were going out on slicks. It really was loading the gun and uh, a job really well done. Hugely enjoyable for all of us involved, from, from me, Bruce Jones, and from John Watson. But uh, hats off, Christopher Haas and the Santalot Racing Team, they got it right. So we enjoyed that enormously. And uh, the first of our two races coming this afternoon, a packed agenda, a packed programme here at Zandvoort. The day started damp and grey. Some rain came in. The rain has cleared, almost sunny. And uh, for a lot of the drivers, a job very, very well in done indeed. And for others, it's a question of what might have been. But uh, certainly for Christopher Haas, it will be a big smile on his face because that was delivering in the toughest conditions of all, with track conditions changing not by the minute, changing almost by the second. The wind starting to dry the track a little bit, greasy offline. But if you could have the running line with nobody else upon it, it was your opportunity to work your way to the front. But with 28 cars going out to play on a twisty circuit, there was always that opportunity. Your best lap could be ruined. But for a lot of the drivers, there's Christopher Haas. Very, very happy indeed down with Santalot Racing. Really good job from him there, John. As always, I mean, Christopher Haas, he kind of flies under the radar a number of times. But he has got skill. He is a great contributor to the Audi program. There you can see, there you can see the joy. I mean, it, it's, you, you don't often, you've got, well, if you compete in all 10 rounds of the Blancpain Challenge, you've got at least 10 chances to, to be in pole position. And often it's the usual suspects, but great for Christopher Haas, so great for Santa Lock to have it. And they, they did it because they did the best job. No question, they did the best job in Q2 of anybody this morning. 
Yeah, there's uh, Christian, Mises, Christian yeah. Mises, who unfortunately really only had 10 minutes of the 20 minutes, his tall teammate alongside Charles Vietz. Tenth fastest, but in fact, that's a very good recovery. But I think you're quite right, John. When conditions are like this, they're changing. The teams really earn their corn as well as the drivers. Look at it, look Christopher Mises' hand. I, I don't know if he's talking about an adjustment on the brake balance or on the ABS. So while the technical talk goes on, we have Dakota who's headed out to find the driver who took pole position, Christopher Haas. Chris, now after a year of quite bad luck so far, it's nice to be recognised, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's really true. Um, being on a pole position, is, uh, especially in these conditions here in Sanford, is uh, something tough to do. But I have to say the Team Sandalog did a great job to support me in, in, yeah, in this situation. I had a fantastic car. The Audi is running like really great pole position. I mean, it's the first job what you can do, but race is the other thing, which is, uh, let's say, even tougher. And yeah, now we have to be focused, stay focused and uh, hope for a trophy at the end of the weekend. Fingers crossed for you. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to hear from Christopher Hartzell there. Yes, as he said, the first part of the job done has been on the podium this year with Simon Gachet uh, at Misano last time out. So aiming for the top step. That will be for the second of our two races, but the first one, race one, sorted by their teammates, will be this afternoon at 2.35, 14.35 here at Zambort. That is all from us here this morning. It's been quick fire, it's been fun. The track continues to dry, uh, but right now we're just going to sit back and uh, enjoy what went on at the end of that session. Uh, it was a uh, quick fire all the way to the finish. So do join us this afternoon at 14.35 for the start of race number one. <laughs>